It's such a pleasure to welcome you all to uh, today's Dean's Innovative Leader Series. We're delighted, honored to welcome back to MIT Sloan, uh, Stu Levenick. As you know, Stu is one of our own. Stu's degree um, is uh, from our Sloan Fellows Program in 1995. Uh, you know that Stu is the retired group president for Caterpillar. Uh, he's had an extraordinary career with respect to increasing and varied responsibilities in an, an amazingly diverse set of locations. Um, I'm going to let him talk to you about it, but uh, 1977 was um, uh, his time of joining Caterpillar uh, as initially a marketing and sales representative. Uh, going on through increasing management responsibilities in Vancouver and Singapore, um, to being a group manager in the Commonwealth of Independent States at the time, um, out of Moscow, um, activity in Japan, uh, later becoming um, group president since 2004 for Caterpillar, uh, expanding their dealer network, expanding them into emerging markets and new industries. Um, and he's here to tell you about that journey. If I may also mention for a person or two who might be um, a sports fan, uh, 1976, um, out of the University of Illinois, he was drafted in the ninth round by the then Baltimore Colts. Uh, an amazing person, a wonderful leader in our community. Please welcome Stu Vlevnik. Well, thank you, uh, Dean. Uh, we had a chance to talk briefly, and I got caught up on uh, what's going on here at MIT, and uh, really amazing since, since I've left. And, uh, I really, I've really enjoyed it. That was, it was a great opportunity to kind of get, kind of get caught up. Um, I've done this kind of thing. I've, I've actually never done it at MIT. When I was going to school here, we did this on a weekly basis and really enjoyed it. Because you had to ask really crazy questions, uh, you know, not business necessarily oriented, but uh, questions about people's lives, how they, how, you know, their leadership styles and so forth. So hopefully we'll get into that uh, after I give you this, this little entree into, into my, uh, my career. Um, I think maybe the best way to start this off would just be to uh, start with the end, uh, which is, uh, which is, uh, Dean Schmettlin just said, um, uh, I wound up as a group president at Caterpillar. Uh, for those of you that, that uh, may know, CAT's a, a global company, over half our sales, over half our people are outside the United States now, and it kind of grew from about eight billion when I was when I hired in in 1977 to our peak at about 67 billion three years ago. Tougher times right now due to a global downturn in most of the industries, but really a strong global player. Um, uh, group president, what is that? Uh, I was a member of the executive office. There were five of us, and each of us essentially we had divided the company up into uh, essentially end-to-end -end businesses, which is kind of a new concept. And during the 10 years that I was there, we went from a, kind of a decentralized business unit organizational structure to end-to-end -end businesses and created really just really four end-to-end -end businesses, a mining business, a construction business, a power business, and then the business that I ran, which is called customer dealer support, was essentially the aftermarket. So it included all the parts manufacturer, component manufacturer, parts distribution, a worldwide dealer organization, all of our marketing activities, all the support that we had for dealers. And, and dealer is an important concept here at Caterpillar because they have more assets and more people than Caterpillar. And it's an entirely independent organization that sells and services our products worldwide. Very interesting business model, very unique in a lot of ways. So that was also part of it. And uh, during that time, a number of things happened which we can, we, which we can talk about. The institution of leadership values-based management, uh, big acquisitions we made in the power sector, in the rail sector, in the mining sector, and also some uh, divestitures. We divested some assets that weren't uh, necessarily core to our business and took that money and plowed it back in. So it was a tremendous uh, experience uh, for those 10 years. In addition, I, I joined outside boards. Uh, Professor Stu Myers is here. He was a board member with me re up until recently on the energy board, which I'm still a member. Uh, became a member of the Granger board. Uh, 10 years ago, was also active in public policy in terms of things like uh, U.S. China Business Council, U.S. Russia Bus Business Council, um, uh, the Association of Equipment Manufacturers. I was a chairman of that organization, and of course, executive uh, director for for the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, where we were lobbying Washington for policy changes in support of business. 
But that's kind of how it, how it wound up. Maybe more interesting is, uh, for all of you, is maybe how it got started. Uh, I could probably be described as uh, the unexpected executive. Um, came from a small town, uh, Washington, Illinois, about 4,500 people. Uh, it's a small town near Peoria, which is the headquarters of Caterpillar. My dad was a research engineer for Caterpillar. And I can tell you, growing up, while I, I love the company, it was probably the last place I ever thought I'd go to work. Just, I just, I mean, I liked it, but I just didn't think that that, that would be the way it would work out. I went to uh, the University of Illinois uh, and enrolled in engineering. Uh, after about two years of that, I loved science, but I decided I didn't like engineering anymore, at least that much of it, and I got into life science. Eventually went through uh, biology and ecology and wound up in forest management, of all things. And the idea was to get a master's in business uh, combined with a, an undergrad in forest management and go to work for companies like um, Weyerhaeuser, International Paper, you know, Boise Cascade, something like that. Uh, as the dean mentioned along the way, uh, I also uh, was an athlete. I was a walk-on at Illinois. Well, I wanted to play football, but I didn't get recruited and had a pretty good career there. Earned a scholarship, got to play, became a starter, and eventually got drafted in the NFL. Uh, I had an illustrious career, <laughs> one year. <laughs> uh, but I made the team and then uh, unfortunately I had a career-ending knee injury. But I had already graduated and went back to grad school in Illinois and then ultimately uh, uh, decided to go out into the marketplace. And at the time, the forest industry, which had been my target industry to, to work in, was uh, in terrible recession. So I began to look around at adjacent companies that had you know, some connection to that industry. And, applied at CAT as well as many other companies, and they turned out to give me the best offer. So that's how I wound up at Caterpillar. And as I talk to student groups like this, usually, the, and, and particularly new employees at CAT, they always want to know in the beginning, well, obviously you had this all worked out from the beginning, right? You know, division manager by 30, vice president by 40, executive VP by 45, and group president by 50, and then CEO, right? You, you had a plan. Uh, no, no. My plan was really was more about focusing on inputs rather than outcomes. So I really had no end point in mind other than I want to constantly get better. And so I looked at what are my interests. I like people. I thought I could be a good leader, but I wasn't sure. But I looked at the things I needed to do to strengthen my own personal portfolio. So that as opportunities arose, I'd be able to concentrate and move forward. And MIT fit into that later on. Um, I, uh, you know, so from there I started in, in, in a marketing and sales role at Caterpillar. I, my first job was in Eugene, Oregon, then I moved to Toronto, Ontario, where I met my wife. Uh, that was interesting. Uh, a benefit that came along with the job that I hadn't, hadn't contemplated. It wasn't part of my plan, but it's worked out great. We just celebrated uh, 30 years of marriage. Uh, from there back to Peoria and to Vancouver, as was mentioned, where I had a responsibility to work with one of our largest dealers in the world, down in Jacksonville, Florida. So we were moving around quite a bit. And, and at that point in time, as we talked before the meeting here this morning, I was sitting around having a drink with Nancy one night, and I'd always wanted to have an international assignment. Cal was a global company. I felt like, well, that was probably a possibility. But it hadn't happened up to then. And so I said, well, um, I guess it's never going to happen. You know, it's going to be a good career, but I'm not going to go international. Well, literally, about three days later, I get a call from my, my boss. He said, well, sell your house, put your stuff in storage. Uh, you've been nominated to go to Sloan School, which was just tremendous. Complete surprise. I had been reading this, the uh, uh, Sloan publications that would come out from time to time, and just because I always thought the articles were very interesting, had a lot of rigor, so I, I knew a lot about it, but I had never expected I'd get selected to go here. So off we went to Boston and had probably one of the great experiences of, uh, of my life. Uh, we had a class at that time of about 46 uh, students. And this all seems, I'm sure this all seems, oh, of course, you know, they had a diverse class, right? Well, this is a pretty foreign thing, pardon the pun, at that time. Over half the class was from Asia. We had a big Latin American population, and I would say about a third maybe was, uh, was U.S. nationals, half of which were government employees, uh, people from the Defense Department, uh, government institutions. So it was really a good broad mix of, of students. 
And so we had a great opportunity to learn from each other throughout that year. Um, one of the things that impressed me, uh, obviously, was the reputation for academic excellence here, of which you all are part of, but also the rigor, the detail, uh, you know, that, that really this place became renowned for. So we spent uh, the year really being imbued with you know, how to learn again. After you've been on and working for 10 or 15 years, you kind of lose a little of this. So this was really a reignition, if you will, of my desire to learn. And it, and it really helped me not only to get caught up to speed with all the best and brightest, but also I think reignited a, a desire to learn that, that stayed with me through the rest of my career. Um, one of the, so you know, people always say, well, what was so great about your experience here? Well, obviously that, you know, I was exposed to best and brightest um, along those, those curriculum that I studied. But I think the other thing is very important, and I would encourage all of you to take advantage of it. This is a place that will provide tremendous perspective. You, you pick out a chosen field of study and you really focus on that. But the innovations that occur here, the breakthroughs that occur here, I mean, what we saw then wasn't going to be commercialized for five or 10 years, but you had a chance to reach outside of your chosen field of study and to, to get involved with that. And that, that is a tremendous advantage as a leader to gain perspective on what's going on around you rather than just a specific thing you might be focused on. <clears throat> Another thing that, uh, and I think probably the, the thing that probably had the biggest impact on me was the last course that I took that year. And it's a course called Choice Points. And um, it, it was a course taught by um, a retired uh, professor. Uh, and uh, the, the course was essentially called Choice Points. It was making, dis making decisions, making, making eth ethical decisions in the environment of uh, uncertainty. And uh, Abe Siegel taught the course, Dean Emeritus at Sloan School at that time. He's passed away now. Um, but Dave has brought me up to speed that uh, there's been a long line of people uh, waiting to, to teach this course because it's, it's such a cool course. But the course material, those of you, show of hands, how many people have taken it? Not yet. Okay, well, I encourage you to think about that. Yeah, this is, this is really good stuff. Because what, what happens is after you go through your academic education, all the rigor, all the detail, you know, it, and it's exceptional. What that course teaches you is that will get you 90% of the way to a good decision. The other 10% is going to come from not here, but here. And the course material was essentially um, novels. Julius Caesar, Billy Budd, Frankenstein, Death of a Salesman. So each course would, or each class would be one of those novels. And during that class, we would discuss the decision that that character had to make. And you know, the, the point of the course was there's no necessarily right or wrong answer. Should Billy Budd have been hanged or set free? No answer, right? You might have an opinion. But it taught you that after all that rigor, you had to find a way, a framework on which to make ethical decisions. In other words, you had to have a foundation of values. And that was a tremendous, values-based management wasn't something that was very popular at that time. It was just kind of coming into to its own. And it was, to me, a real revelation and a great way to end my educational experience at MIT because I took that with me as I then went on to the next part of my career, which was Southeast Asia. So from there, Caterpillar decided to send me to Singapore. So literally a year before, I wasn't going to have an international career. Now I'm in Singapore, which is, for those of you who have been there, a pretty, pretty nice place to be. And I had responsibility for all of Southeast Asia, from India to Australia. At that time, it did not include China or Japan. But uh, this is the time of the Asian tigers, and the economies were booming. And, and this is where I learned about uh, you know, the unexpected uh, challenges that occur in business. In 1997, we had the all-time greatest sales year in our history in that part of the world for the first six months. And we had a big board meeting out there, a big celebration. Don Feitz, who'd been a, he was our chairman at the time, he had been a Sloan fellow as well, had the board out there, and we were just hats and horns. This is great. Well, the second half of that year, we went negative. The Asia crisis occurred, all the, all the currencies imploded. It was, you know, <laughs> unbelievable, to say the least. So, we spent the next year basically making sure all of our dealers survived, making sure we survived, and moving excess inventory and so forth all around the world. And we wrote it out pretty well. And, uh, and then I was sent to, uh, to Moscow. 
And um, we had long been selling, Cat had always had a history of being first into markets. And at the time of the Soviet Union, obviously you couldn't do business in the Soviet Union, but you could do business with the Soviet Union. So we were selling them uh, pipeline machinery, we're selling engines and the like so that they could, you know, uh, basically exploit their, their mineral resources. But we never had any people in country. Well, when the wall fell, um, it became uh, potential for us to basically move there and establish a footprint, and that was my job. So I was sent there, first general manager we ever had in the country to, to essentially build our, our plat platform there. So during that time, we established our first manufacturing presence outside of St. Petersburg, and we established a Caterpillar dealer organization in the CIS, um, all independent dealers, not owned by Caterpillar, and we did that three years. The, the manufacturing presence initially, it was, kind of, it was kind of creative, was to manufacture components. There was no market to sell anything in Russia at the time, or very little, certainly nothing that would support an assembly operation, but we would export those fabrications to Western Europe for assembly. And then the idea was when the market finally developed, then we turned that supply chain around and sourced the market. And that's exactly what's, what's happened today. That, that factory manufactures construction equipment for consumption in, in Russia and the CIS. And uh, the business has grown from essentially nothing to a couple billion dollars, albeit with uh, some pretty rough uh, political situation right now with all the strife in, in Ukraine and the rest and the sanctions and all the rest of it. It's a real challenge to to maintain a workforce there and, and continue to operate, but, they, but they're doing a good job of that. And then from there, uh, I went to uh, Japan. Oh, I also should mention, after the, after the Asian crisis, the first thing that happened when I arrived in Russia was the ruble collapse. So we were, ma we were making payroll with suitcases and money. We were the, <laughs> the normal banks didn't function. It was, it's unbelievable, kind of the things that went on. But um, we got through it. And then I went to Japan. and. Uh, I was beginning to wonder if there's a death wish. Uh, Japan was in the throes of the, the lost decade. And uh, unbelievable. So we, I went there to manage, at the time, Caterpillar's oldest and largest joint venture called Shin Caterpillar Mitsubishi. When Japan opened up after the war, uh, the only way in for a multinational or US company was to form a joint venture. And the joint venture wasn't your decision, it was the Ministry of Industry that decided. And so our partner was a competitor, Mitsubishi Heavy Industries. The joint ventures were all 50-50, and most of you know joint ventures typically don't work, number one, but 50-50s really don't work. And in Japan, we had, a, we had a leadership, the way the thing was managed was a mirror organization. One Japanese, one American, a complete mirror organization of each other. So this is what I, in the last decade, nothing's going well. So I went there, and uh, pretty interesting experience. Pretty interesting experience. A great lesson in diversity and inclusion. Tremendous. And again, I, I banked on some of the stuff that I learned here. When you go to a Japanese uh, board meeting, and everybody's got the same suit on, everybody looks the same except you, <laughs> and uh, no one says anything, and it's pretty well dictated how things are gonna go. This is not an inclusive environment. And uh, so, um, I learned that uh, early on, I figured out that you know, the Japanese business culture and the US business culture, fundamentally, I mean, I've never seen two more different cultures. Everybody's got a different culture, but these are really, really different. You know? So, we'd go to a board meeting and we'd have um, a legal sized paper, about 30 sheets, with font number six and, and, and no margins. I mean, this is like wall to wall <laughs> detail, rigor. You could hardly, my eyes are bad today, I think, because of it. And uh, he's go, geez, so Pete. <laughs> and of course, then there's the American view, you know, oh, we, that detail's baloney. You know, we want the big bang, you know, the blue dot, the end run strategy. Well, either one of them, right. But if you had patience, what you learned was if you combine their rigor for discipline, execution, combined with some really good strategic thinking that was coming from the other side, hey, you could actually wind up with a strategy you could execute. Pretty cool stuff. And so we did some pretty interesting things. Uh, first was we realized that like Russia, it was now time to really expand our presence in China. So I had res my responsibilities were increased to all of Asia. And that was about the time Kat decided we really need to build out our China footprint as well as our India footprint. And Japan as a joint venture was really, pardon the pun, was on an island. It wasn't integrated into Kat, which is a critical part of the way the business runs. 
So we needed to fix that. So the first thing we needed to do was acquire the other half of, of Shin, Caterpillar, Shin Caterpillar Mitsubishi. And of course, doing that is involves a lot of cultural sensitivity because the Japanese don't like number one, change very much, at least they didn't at that time, particularly MHI. And they didn't want it to look as an embarrassing situation that this US multinational was going to buy out their share. But anyway, three years later, we figured out a way to get it done, and everybody was happy. We were then able to integrate that into the rest. At the same time, we had, I think, probably about three factories in China. We were operating there. But our business model really wasn't built out. So we set on a path to really dramatically accelerate that. And that meant building out not only manufacturing, but supply chain, a finance organization. We were the number two finance company in China, right behind GE. Uh, set up, build out our dealer organization, set up design centers. We have three design centers there now. Everything at Caterpillar does in the world is done there. And not only just for China, but it's a fully integrated part of the rest of the world. India much the same, although a little bit slower pace. And then some more uh, manufacturing expansion occurred in the rest of Southeast Asia as the business was growing to support and consume the products we were making. So it was a pretty cool time. So uh, then I, I, I got the call to come back to, uh, to the United States as a group president. And uh, the first thing, uh, was a pretty interesting job. At that time, we were organized. The group president had five or six divisions, but unrelated. We were operating the company with 32 vice presidents, each had an independent business, not necessarily related, profit centers. And you know, organizations kind of go back and forth and so forth. But at the time, uh, it, pretty interesting, because essentially you could say the company was run by 32 independent businesses, the roll-up of which was results of the company. Well, as time went on, it became obvious that uh, that wasn't the way to go. We needed to restructure and really become more in tune with our customers. And that's where we created these essentially end-to-end, -end, these three large, four large end-to-end -end businesses. Customers all the way through to the supply chain. So you could see all the costs, all the assets, and really make the wisest decisions. And I was part of the effort to do that and then took over running one of those. But maybe one of the more interesting things I did in the beginning when I came back was our chairman at the time, Jim Owens, felt like we really needed to focus on the corporate culture. And, and not to change it, but to do a better job of articulating. Like a lot of companies, uh, we had uh, a very strong view of our culture, and we call it yellow blood. And you'll still hear this around Peoria. If you work for Caterpillar, you got, you got yellow blood. And that's because I was asked, Kathy asked me this morning, Do you, were you surprised that you stayed with Cat for 38 years? Well, actually, no. Uh, most people do. They come there, they just like it. And it's because it's got such an interesting business model, interesting relationships, and uh, places, things you can do. It's a great place to come and grow. And, and, and prosper. So that yellow blood concept sort of imbued that idea. You know, as a company that cared about its employees, the companies were very loyal. And, but as we grew, it was hard to articulate what that meant, particularly as you went international. What's that mean to Chinese employees? Yellow blood. I mean, you got to be from Peoria to have that? You know, geez. So anyway, you know, what we didn't do is go hire a consultant and come back and tell us what that meant. We formed a, a small, you know, <laughs> a small group of employees, and uh, we went out and talked to people from the factory floor to the executive office to our suppliers or dealers, customers. What does it mean to you? What's Caterpillar's values? When you think of cat, what, is it, what does it resonate? And they really came up with four simple words. Integrity, commitment, excellence, and teamwork. Integrity was simple, and these are things you could basically put in any language and communicate to your employees that these are how we're going to run the business. This is our DNA. Integrity meant do what you say. Commitment was commitment to customers, commitment to employees, commitment to communities. Uh, teamwork. Caterpillar is a decentralized company, but it's highly integrated. Uh, we, uh, we, we probably have the highest percentage of, of captive content in our industry. We make all our own components. Uh, we're all over the place. We've got a lot of different focuses and a lot of different businesses, but they all integrate. It's very, very important to have an enterprise perspective. And that's a key attribute of being a leader at CAT, is to focus on what you're doing, but also collaborate across silos, across businesses. So this idea of teamwork was really a big deal. Plus, uh, everything we sell goes to an independent dealer organization, totally independent. Uh, and we're held together by a mutual performance agreement. Not a contract, mutual performance agreement. In other words, a sales and service agreement. They do this, we do this. The contract isn't a franchise, it's worth zero. 
and it's cancelable in 90 days without cause by either party. Now imagine that. We had a dealer in Northwest, a dealer in Canada, Finning International. It's an $8 billion public company. Half our dealers now are publicly owned. But if you read the proxy statements down there, they disclose that, yes, our agreement with Caterpillar is cancelable in 90 days without cause. That's pretty big. How does that work? Imagine that. Eight billion in sales at risk, 90 days. Well, it, it works because there's mutual obligation on both parties. There's teamwork. And there's give and take. And it's a, it's a fantastic uh, model that has really, really served us well. So that notion of teamwork uh, was, was really, really important. And we created this thing, and then, uh, so the first thing was, okay, here's how, this is what we believe. Now how do we want to operate the company? So we created a leadership, leadership framework. And that framework essentially, again, revolved around something simple. Uh, we described our leadership framework, our profile, as three things. Vision, the ability to understand opportunities and turn those into shareholder value. Execution, obviously, you know, you got to execute the vision you put in place. But that was more about creating a climate creating an environment where you would engage employees so they would exercise discretionary efforts. So it was all about what are my leadership styles, competencies that allow me to, to motivate, to encourage, to engage employees to succeed. And then the third uh, attribute was, uh, of the profile was legacy. How do you build a team after you that sustains this company, sustains the future of the company? So vision, execution, legacy. And then we created a profile of leadership competencies uh, that essentially helped to define who you were, what your competencies were, what you could do to enhance or in some cases dilute some of the things that might be negative to creating that climate for execution. And then we, as leaders, we had a concept as leaders, as teachers, to be, be able to go and teach that to our employees. And as an executive, we would spend 25, 30, 40 percent of our time teaching teaching our business plan, teaching our business model, teaching values, teaching leadership styles, and so forth. So it, it really became a, uh, I would say, a, a tremendous uh, um, thing, I think, for Caterpillar, and really helped us move forward and create a much more uh, vibrant uh, uh, body of uh, leaders. Today we have probably the youngest leadership team in the history of the company, the most diverse team in the history of the company, and I would say probably the most inclusive. Um, so uh, I think it really uh, it pays big dividends down the road for, for the company. Um, so, you know, what did I learn? Um, I had a great experience in sports. Some of the things that I learned there about competitiveness, about dedication, about teamwork, I carried with me, you know, the rest of my life. Uh, it, at MIT, the, obviously the rigor and academic excellence the perspective I've gained from reaching out you know, broadly across this tremendous institutional organization uh, really, I think, gave me a broader perspective of the world than I otherwise would have had. The, the foundation for business values was, was terrific. And then the experiences overseas in Asia and, and Russia and Japan and, of course, back into the leadership role at, at CAT gave me an opportunity to really put those in place and to participate in this value-based management thing with that, which I, which I really believed in, and, and, and goes back to you know, Abe Siegel's Choice Points class. So uh, I, I just had a tremendous experience here, uh, and, and you have that opportunity now. Yeah, I, you know, I, I encourage all of you to really take the utmost advantage of it. Wherever you go, trust me, when they see the brass rat, everybody knows what that means. And uh, it's, it's a fraternity or a sorority, if you will, using an analogy that everybody understands. And if you have that experience, it's uh, highly valued. You have that now, so best of luck to you. Thanks. Uh, we have microphones on either side for the, uh, for the grilling. <laughs> Thank you very much for your, uh, for your talk. I have a question, because your background is much more international, and you get into different uh, uh, national cultures. And you also mentioned the organizational culture and also leadership. Mm -hmm. So I wonder, during the time that when organizational culture and uh, conflict with national culture, uh, culture conflicts, how did you use your leadership to solve the problem? Thank you. Well, that's uh, it's a it's an excellent question, but that's essentially the fundamental of 
of good leadership is to understand those differences and bridge them. I would tell you that creating Caterpillar values and being able to articulate those, um, integrity, commitments, excellence, and teamwork, and, and take, for example, China. China. People wondered, would this, how would this work in China? Would this, would this play? And it turned out it trans, transferred perfectly. People really understood that. And if you live those every day, it became part of them. I mean, today, if you go to our Chinese operations, they would recite those same values to you just like I did. And, and they would live that every day. And so where culture conflicts with that organizational culture, uh, you know, leaders have to, you know, I mean, you get principles that you're going to live by in a company, but you'll find a way to bridge those and, and, and to make sure that people move forward on the, on the values that you put forward. But it's, uh, that's why you have, a, I, th I think, a, a very defined corporate culture is to, one, say what you're going to do, but then actually live it. it served us very well. Am I okay to ask a question back here? Oh, there you go. Sorry. Sorry. Hi, thank you for coming. Um, it's thank really great to hear your story, and Caterpillar sounds like a really wonderful place to work. Um, one of the questions that I have is um, sort of a human capital question. You mentioned that Caterpillar really promotes this concept of leaders as teachers, right. and that you spend about, I think it was 40 to 45% of your time really teaching. Yeah. How do you think other organizations can help mirror that? Because that seems like probably provided the most value as far as sharing your values and sharing the strategy and making sure everyone's on the same page? Well, I think the, the simple answer is if they don't do it, I think they're going to fail. I don't think it's sustainable if you don't do that. I mean, when I, when I came to CAT, you know, as, a, as an early hire, uh, we talked about this a little bit before, but 1970s, most of the big U.S. firms, at least, for the most part, were being run by people that had military experience. And so it was a very regimented, you know, command and control type thing. Well, that, you know, I mean, that ran its course, I guess, but that's not possible today. If you're still, if you're still doing that as a leader, you've got to be the smartest person in the room. How about you? But I'm not. And that's where inquiry, debate, inclusiveness, that's, that really adds value. And I had a working laboratory of that when I was in Asia. You know, I was forced into that environment. I could see the, the advantages of that. So, we came about that, you know, not necessarily, we just didn't invent that. We, we were benchmarking other companies that were doing the same thing. And 30 or 40% of our time spent teaching is not the, it's, it's certainly not the highest percentage. I mean, other companies, I think GE talks about 70%. Uh, you know, it, it's probably a loose definition about what teaching and communicating is. But nevertheless, I think the point is you need to engage your employees from top to bottom. And you need to create a strategy a business model, a set of values that's understood from top to bottom. You can never give everybody all the rules, right? They got to know what to do. And that's where those values, that's where that, that leadership model comes into practice. Because in the, in the absence of regulations and policies and all, you know, all that, they'll know what to do and they'll take action like that and make the right call. So the answer is if you want to succeed, you got to do that today and you got to do it well. Yes, sir. Well, I want to uh, thank you for coming. And uh, as a member of the current Sloan Fellow class, oh. we're grateful to <laughs> have one of ours um, up there. I uh, was wondering about, as you made so many transitions in your career, uh, what were those initial steps that you took as you took over your own organization, both uh, as they saw you as a friend and also as a potential threat? And how did you? structure yourself um, in dealing with that challenge of gaining those, those potential um, rivals over to you, to your side? Mm -hmm. Well, it, it, depended, uh, it depended where I was. I mean, obviously, when you, uh, and I think this is an important uh, aspect of, uh, of a leadership uh, profile. One thing I learned is leaders are different. They have different um, behavior depending on the situation. So if you come into a situation where the house is on fire and you got to take action, you're probably going to be a pretty directive, pace-setting type leader. If you come into a business that's operating well, it's different. Um, so I had a mix of all of those, and it depended on the situation I was in as to how forceful I had to be initially. But one thing I always found was just go talk to people as much as you can. Just go listen and learn. 
and, and you'll find people, you know, first of all, especially early on, they're trying to figure you out. What, you know, who, who is this person? He, is he gonna tell me what to do? Or is he gonna listen to what my concerns? And then what actions are they gonna take? So the easiest thing to say is, and it's, it sounds simple, it's not always simple, but to go listen and listen to all parts of your organization, and particularly your customers, because you'll learn a lot. And then, then, you, then you decide, okay, how fast do I push? How much time do I have to take action? If, I, if action's even required, maybe, maybe everything is just fine. And the culture thing comes into that as well that we talked about before. You know, lots of different, uh, I know when I went to Japan, the first thing I, I did is I, uh, I got with a couple of the Japanese salesmen who were uh, you know, calling on some of our bigger customers and I said, let's go call on some customers. So we uh, got in the car and drove out. And on the way, we, I, I saw a big fleet of equipment working on the side of the road and it was a, pretty much all Komatsu equipment, which is our key competitor in the world. And so I said, well, you know, let's go call on these guys. Let's go talk to the guys buying the competitive equipment. This was, no, 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 I can't do that. Why not? Well, because if we call on their customers, they'll call on ours. I hadn't quite understood that culture, but, but I was patient. You know, I, 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 I learned from that and uh, slowly figured out a way to get them motivated to become a, a, a market share leader in Japan. But you, you had to have that cultural sensitivity, and you couldn't read that out of a book. You had to actually feel it. Because these are the guys on the ground floor. It's not the senior leaders. So that's how you learn a lot about it. I have a question right here. Ah. Hello. Um, good morning. Uh, thank you very much for, uh, for coming here. Yeah. I guess uh, I am uh, one of the representatives of the Yellow Blood. Uh, I have been uh, working for CAT for like 18 years within dealerships and corporate. Ah. So kind of uh, believe on which, those. Uh, which dealer? Uh, Jacolsa in Columbia. Oh, Jacolsa in Columbia, yeah, yeah. sure. Yeah. So, um, and uh, you know, during this time, during uh, 18 years that I worked here, I saw some amazing technologies like uh, autonomous vehicles mm -hmm. in mining applications and um, um, fleet management systems that actually map. And all of this, those technologies were developed like back in the uh, late 90s. And, uh, yeah. and you know, I always was impressed that uh, somehow uh, Cat Caterpillar was not able to leverage that technology into, into more value and capture the whole thing. Now we see companies like Uber and um, Tesla trying to gather that technology that perhaps is already there in Caterpillar. How companies can actually capture that value that is beyond their, their original purpose? And, and what technologies do you think Caterpillar have today that could change the world in the future? and what technologies are changing or might change the business outlook of Caterpillar in the future? Yeah, that's a, it, it's a great thesis. <laughs> I, this is a great question because this is where I get to give a management review to the guys I used to work with. Um, <laughs> it's, just, it's just really fun. Uh, so, so the whole internet of things, let's say, let's call it that, for lack of a better description. And, and we were talking about this before. Today, CAD has about three million installed units in the field, largest field population in our industry, enormous, working every day. About 20% of those are, are equipped with what we call a product link, or it's a, it's a mobile transmission device of data, so real-time data feedback to us. So that's, uh, that's, that's a lot. I mean, it's you know, 600,000 machines. But every machine today that's sold goes out with that. So you've got a legacy fleet out there that's not equipped. And, and we'll see whether or not we can figure out how to, you know, to re-equip those machines, update them, and, and retrofit. But everything going out has, that, has that, uh, that capability. And it has presented, I think, uh, a tremendous conundrum to the historical business model. And that's why it has taken a lot of companies such a long time to get their mind around this. You know, if you talk to the engineering groups at CAT, when they build a, a bulldozer, I mean, we're spending millions of dollars to get 2% improvement on horsepower, drawbar pull, you know, the ability to push material. A lot of money and not much of a gain. The technology coming off the data has, has the potential to release untold value far beyond that. 20, 30, I mean, just to, to uh, digitize a, a construction job and automatically control vehicles, 
We've seen 70, 80 percent productivity improvement on a job site. Unbelievable. Think what that is from a sustainability point of view. Safety, use of fuel, use of resources, time. Unbelievable. But, but that runs counter to the historical thinking about how we build what we build. Ah, we build big bulldozers, we make them bigger, more productive. Well, I can tell you that's all changed. Uh, probably the biggest area, at least on the science side, where we're hiring people today is data scientists. Uh, so we are taking that data and turning it into solutions. You'd be surprised to know that uh, Uber, you know, the sharing economy, we've got two pilots underway right now, same kind of an idea, sharing equipment. What do you see when you drive down the highway in a construction job? Machines parked all over the place. Man, that's a lot of assets sitting there doing nothing. What if we acted as the marketplace to connect those idle machines with customers who had work to do? Now this obviously <laughs> reduces, in the short term at least, reduces the opportunity to sell new products. But we also do pretty well in the aftermarket and running products are a good source of revenue and capital, and so revenue and profit, and so, uh, and it makes customers more successful. So we're looking at those types of things. There's a big one running in the, in the Western US right now called Yard Sale. There's one we're running in Turkey right now, same thing. We're the marketplace, if you will, the integrator for providing customers machines, not that we own or our dealers own, but that they own, but they share within a community. And along the way, if they've got needs that can't be satisfied by that, by that uh, ecosystem, of course, we can add a machine or provide financing or insurance maybe even buy fuel on a collective basis for the customers and lower their, so there's all kinds of uh, innovation that's coming, but it's not all the traditional iron. And I think that's been, that's been a tough uh, you know, change, if you will, transition, but it's definitely happening. Doesn't mean we're not spending money on, on technology and machines and productivity, but there's an awful lot taking place in this whole big data, data analytics space. I think it's gonna change the world. And as, as, as it has everything else, this industry won't be immune from it either. So, don't sell your stock. <laughs> yes, sir. Ma'am. Hi. It's here. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Well, thank you for coming and talking to us. My question is, you said you didn't want to change the culture. Uh, you wanted to articulate it better. But you had 32 businesses, which apparently ran independently. Yeah. How do you, how do you make it to articulate a common and underlying culture? with so many different businesses that have so many different strategies and approaches to the market? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and it's one of the reasons we changed that organization back to a, a much more end-to-end -end business. Uh, two reasons. One is, that over time, that, that's exactly what did happen. They began to create their own little culture. They all started to basically have their own brand. Pretty soon, you're diluting, I mean, you know, what's Caterpillar? You got 32 independent businesses? Why don't we just divest them all? And if that's the answer, that'll be more shareholder value. It wasn't, obviously, because we're highly integrated. But uh, that, I think the good news is it didn't go far enough that it had really become fractured. Everybody that was there of a certain age had all those core values. It was a matter of really articulating it so all the younger people coming up you know, could see what that meant. And we could communicate it more effectively so that they could execute it. Yeah, but that was probably one of the, the underlying reasons that we restructured. But I would tell you, and you know, those of you who are studying organizational dynamics or the like, uh, there's no perfect organization. You know, my own view of that is they're, they're organisms, right? You create an organization, what's the organization try to do? It tries to evolve to make it easier for itself. And so as a leader, you've constantly got to be in tune with customers, employers, suppliers, and try to stay ahead of that, to keep it channeled in a way that's going to produce the right answer for, to, you know, to meet your, your basic values in your business model. Question in the back. Hello. Thank you very much for, uh, for your speech. Extremely enlightening. <laughs> um, I have a question about one of the, one of Kat's values, commitment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We spoke, we touched on commitment to clients, commitment to employees. I wanted to speak about uh, Kat's commitment to community, which you mentioned. Yeah. Um, in, uh, in a recent talk, Michael Porter said that that's one of his uh, key pillars for companies to regain competitiveness. I wanted to know if you agree with this and if it, in China, for example, it was one of the key success factors that you saw. And if so, how did CAT go about uh, committing to the community? Yeah, I, I think it's probably also, 
you guys are pretty polite. You know, there's, if you read the papers right now, Cat's going through a tough time. They're going through a restructuring and a bunch of layoffs, and that's, that's a real load on the communities. So we'll, I'll come back to that in a minute. But regardless, or, or read your question on China, I think it, is, it's, it, it was a very differentiating factor for Cat in the way that we um, grew our business there. Our, our business never, in China never started in Beijing. We didn't go there and have a big, you know, big show and and and, and uh, you know try to make relationships with the party in in in, uh, in Beijing. We started in Chuzhou, which is sort of this out of the way place, the joint venture there, um, and in the it's a good it's a good proxy I think for the way that we pursued our our footprint development all over the world. We always started from the ground, so the lowest level, and kind of worked our way up. So we built relationships with the with the local community. We hired people. Um, a great example was we had a big downturn oh, in the late 90s, I think, in China, and a uh, terrible downturn. Most of the multinationals that were there basically laid everybody off and left. We stayed. We kept the people. We trained them during that period. And so what the, you know, it seemed like a, a smart thing to do now. But what that showed was a commitment to the community. It showed us that we were here to stay. You could count on us to be a good partner. And they always remembered that and talked about that. And, uh, and those kinds of examples, I think, is, is uh, what, we, what we meant by that. You know, uh, do things that aren't certainly in the long-term interest of the company, but not the short-term uh, you know, discipline sometimes the markets try to force on you. Uh, as it relates to what's going on now, I mean, there's a tremendous amount of community outreach. And, and naturally, if you go to Peoria right now, uh, there's you know, people being laid off. It's a terrible thing. That's probably the worst thing I ever had to do. And, uh, but unfortunately, from time to time in a cyclical industry, when you make a big bet on the future and it doesn't happen as fast as you think, and you expand your, your human resources and your physical assets, sometimes you have to retrench, and that's what's going on right now. The only thing you can do is do it in a humane way, in line or in parallel with those values you put forward. And people see that. I mean, it might be painful, but uh, if, if they see you act in, in concert with those values, you'll learn their respect. And for those that stay and, and move on and grow the company eventually, it, it, you'll, you'll benefit from that. Good question. Hello. Hello, Mr. Uh, Levenick here. Oh, there we are, yeah. Uh, my name is Andy. Thank you for, for your presentation. I'm from the uh, west of China. My family is running a manufacturing company in China, and we're the supplier to Caterpillar. Oh. Uh, so my question is, and uh, now the uh, production cost is rising in China and the economy is unstable. Uh, what do you think about the Chinese uh, manufacturing companies? Would they still be one of the major suppliers to Caterpillar? And what about the uh, Asian market to Caterpillar? Thank you. Uh, the answer is yes, they will. And that's because China, and again, this is a, again a bit of Caterpillar versus maybe others, but we never had the view that China was a source of low-cost labor or low-cost manufacturing. Now, in the beginning, certainly there were some cost advantages to inputs and so forth, but that was never our long-term view of what would happen there. We always felt like the economy was going to rise. They wanted, you know, Chinese are no different than the rest of the world. They want the same standard of living. Nobody's got a monopoly on brain power virtue, right? It's, you know, you have values, you operate, you're going to succeed, and we expected that would happen there. And of course, you've lived that. So, Interestingly enough, uh, if we took a snapshot of, of productivity, quality, and I haven't seen the latest, you know, I don't, I don't get the latest numbers anymore, but as of a year ago, our Chinese factories were, be, uh, were above Japan. Cost of manufacture was about the same. Now, in, in what's going on in, in China, is mirrors kind of Japan. It's becoming highly mechanized. Robot manufacturing, high technology. So the labor thing is, that was just a stage, I think, of China's evolution. And as you know, if you're in a labor-intensive industry like textiles or clothing or something like that, that's all pretty much moved to other low-cost countries. So it was always in our, in our view that China would become world-class and, and, and competitive on a world-class basis with technology, and that's pretty much what's happening. Now, the challenge is to stay that way. And so what do you do? You benchmark all your, you know, your peer companies and peer, peer plants so that you st and, and employ the best technology and the best practices and policies possible. But that's what's going on there. Oh, I'm being told this is the last question. <laughs> but I've, you know, I, I, it's too bad because I, I kind of enjoy the, the dialogue. This is, this is uh, pretty much like it was like when I was here. So that part of it hasn't changed. Cool. All right, since it's the last question, I'll, I'll make it short and quick. 
Um, you you can make it as long as you want now. <laughs> I think you've got an, you get an open end here. <laughs> um, you've spoken about your uh, transition when you went to work in Toronto and then Vancouver and then from there you went to different countries. Um, I was wondering, was there anything that happened during that time that made it or that actually kicked off the, uh, all the international experiences? And on that note, as you go into some countries, like you mentioned, in some of them you are walked into a challenging environment. Did you have... Um, a number of people looking at you as you're going in there thinking, okay, he's the one who's coming here with all the answers. Now they expect you to resolve all the problems the day one, right? And how did you deal with it? Well, you know, based on the Asia crisis, rural collapse in the last decade, I began to think maybe this was part of the grand scheme to get me out of here, you know. But I think to your point, uh, you know, I'm not sure, part of this is, is your own personality, which I think over the years and all the leadership training I was involved in and, and was made available to me, I think really helped me. So that would be one advice is don't try to be somebody you're not. There's all kinds of leadership stuff out there. Generally, it's all good. Just, but the most important thing is understanding yourself and how to apply those principles to yourself. And I will say, once you come out of here and wherever you go, there is an expectation you have all the answers. I mean, that's just, when I went back to, to work at CAD after leaving MIT, it was like, you know, everybody's kind of like, oh, you know. He is the smartest guy in the room, which is not, I mean, it just, it isn't, you know. You're not. <laughs> Sorry. And uh, at least not for long. <laughs> you are until you make a mistake. So, but I knew that. You know, and that was one of the great advantages of being here. I had, in my class, I had 45 other people reminding me that I wasn't the smartest guy in the room, so, and you could see that. So it was a lesson in this, you know, this whole thing, it's probably overused. But, uh, I mean, diversity by itself doesn't necessarily produce inclusiveness. Inclusiveness, giving everybody a voice at the table, man, that's how you get, that's how you get inquiry and debate. Getting back to how do you make an eth ethical decision in the environment of uncertainty. You have to find a way to get all the best information possible and then have something in here that tells you what to do. And, uh, and that was the lesson I learned here. It's just tremendous. We done? Thanks, everybody. You've got, you got a great opportunity here. Take full advantage.